On today's episode of the McCann Dogs Podcast. All of these things have steps and stages, and we bridge those steps and stages so that we can get from point A to point B with as much finesse as possible. And now, Instructor Shannon. My name is Instructor Shannon, and I am joined today in the studio by Instructor Swanee. Hi, everyone. And we like to get together and sit down and talk about all things dogs and all things dog training related. Mm -hmm. So today's episode is actually inspired by some of the questions that we get in our online training programs. And we offer training both in person and online. Uh, You can check us out at McCannDogs.com for information on that. The inspiration behind this episode is because there is this, there seems to be this divide in this, um, this desire, not necessarily desire, but the, the training and real life tend to get compartmentalized. And we tend to see a lot of people who do the training great and the dogs have fabulous skills, but then in day-to-day life, it can be confusing about how to apply that training. We spend a lot of time coaching our students about how to make training part of your day-to-day life and how to make sure that the the time that you're spending in training is going to be applicable to real life application Mm -hmm. and there's there's some confusion there because of course it's a process so if you're not in a guided program where you're being shown how to work through that process a lot of the times it means that we as humans looking for that end goal will skip all the steps in between and we'll expect the dog to listen before we really put in the time to train. So today I wanted to talk all about that and how you can set yourself up to make sure that you are going to have success at the end of the day versus being confused about how to blend these two worlds together. Right. So let's talk first off. Um, Let's talk first off how we start teaching skills and why. So talk about some of the basic skills. Let's say, for example, you're teaching your dog how to walk nicely on a loose lead. Okay. How would you start that training? Well, I'm going to start in an area where there's no distractions Mm -hmm. and I have the dogs 100% full focus on me. Brilliant. And I call that the white room. Yes. Just, it, it's just an empty canvas. You mm-hmm. know, there's nothing in the room that the dog is conflicted by. And then what would you do at that point with your white room? Once you've taken some time, mm-hmm. the dog understands, you know, they've built value for walking at your side. They've built value for focusing on you and ignoring whatever else is around. What's your next step? I'm going to um, apply a few distractions to my white room. So my white room becomes a little bit colored. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Yes. And and this is part of the process. It's it's appreciating that this is a hard process for us, mm-hmm. but it's also appreciating that it's a hard process for the dog. And often going out there in the real world creates what we call conflict in the dog, where the dog is now distracted by all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. What might be realistic distractions for a dog out there in the real world? Oh, there's many. There's, uh, there's uh, birds, there's squirrels, there's blowing leaves, there's yeah. people, there's noises, there's food on the ground. There's mm-hmm. smells, there's insects. It's, yeah, that's a long list. It's overwhelming. Yeah. And, yes. And that list could truly go on right. and on and on. Yes. And I, I like to think of it when my parents taught me how to drive, they didn't teach me how to drive on our 400 series highways. So in Ontario, oh, those are our good. big four lane busy highways. They drove to a quiet country road or we went to our um our, our mall parking lot on Sundays I, back I remember yeah, those days. Mall back when the mall was closed on yes. Sundays and it was a huge parking lot so that's where I learned how to that was my white room yeah. that's where I learned how to drive and it wasn't until many 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 practices did I ever venture on a highway yeah absolutely and mm-hmm. you know what this is a great analogy I'm really glad that you use this analogy because it's it makes sense to everybody who's learned how to drive a car mm-hmm. you know and, and think about Same thing with learning how to ride a bike. You know, all of these things have steps and stages and we bridge those steps and stages so that we can get from point A to point B Mm -hmm. with as much finesse as possible. So, you know, you you get on your tricycle first off and Mm -hmm. you learn how to operate the machine. Mm -hmm. You learn how to steer it. You learn how to work the pedals. And then from there, you might go to a two-seater, but you put on training wheels. Right. And the training wheels don't Mm -hmm. go from on to off like that. Right. The training wheels wheels go from on to a little bit lifted to a little bit lifted to a little bit more lifted Mm -hmm. and then eventually off so that 
you have that balance point right. where you don't necessarily need to rely on the training wheels. Mm-hmm. This is such a such a good analogy. Yes. And I think it's so important to understand that our dogs are not trying to work against us. No. So I always say when when we send our kids to school, you know, we do so with the idea that they need to learn. So we set them up for op- optimal learning. We put them at a desk. We have everybody in the classroom either be quiet so that you can focus mm-hmm. on your work and you can focus on learning, or you're doing some group learning where there's discussion, et cetera, involved. At no point during learning two plus two equals four, uh, you know, learning math, learning basic math skills, at no point would a clown suddenly come into the room and start juggling or dancing you know, around. Do you want to know something really scary? <laughs> Those I clowns. Was, that was my exact thought. I was gonna <laughs> I was gonna jump in and say the same thing. At no point does a juggler appear. Oh my goodness. Isn't that weird? It we're starting to think weird. the same. Yeah. 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 It, we're sharing the same brain today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, truly. Right? I mean it, it, when we want the child to have a break and to have other things to focus on other than math so that their brain can have a rest, mm-hmm. we send them out to recess. And then, you know, that would be the time for the juggling, et cetera. Right. So there is this setup for optimal learning with the child and the child understands that they're supposed to be learning. I always say with dogs, they don't have a clue that they're supposed to be learning. No. You know, they're just living their lives. They're they're relying on their instinct and they're right. following those instincts and they don't know they're supposed to be doing anything differently exactly. or absorbing and anything. They're reacting to their environment. So yeah. it's like, yeah, oh, something's fun over there. I better go check it out. Absolutely. Yeah, or something scary. I better run away. Yeah. They, yeah, that it, dogs are animals. They react. Precisely. And then as humans, we somehow get slighted by that. Yes. And that right away, I just want to squash that right away. Your dog is not trying to work against you. They're not stubborn. They're not uh, They're not trying to see what they can get away with. I mean, mm. there are certainly times during development where they'll push the envelope a little bit mm-hmm. and they'll see what they can get away with and they'll test the waters. And that's a very normal part of growing and part mm. of their lives and their natural learning state. But that doesn't mean that they have it in for us. It doesn't mean that they're trying their best to frustrate us. We need to set them up so that they can learn well and learn easily and learn in a valuable way Mm -hmm. as well. Because the instinct piece is very valuable to the dog, right? Right. Dogs are opportunistic scavengers. So when they see leaves blowing down the street, Mm -hmm. that's an exciting moment to want to chase those leaves and to want to have a little, you know, interaction and party with the leaves Mm -hmm. and that predatory behavior comes out and whatnot. Exactly. And dogs truly live in the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. They're not thinking about the future. They're not thinking about the past. They are truly in the present moment. Yeah, absolutely. So it's so important that we take the time to be empathetic towards them Mm -hmm. And to teach them lessons that are going to serve us both well in day-to-day life. And that is, that's really, in a nutshell, it's setting them up for good learning and then following through and making sure that they understand. That's what good training is all about. Yes. So from that white room, I and I love the white room. I, we talk about the white room a lot. And I think it's such an important piece of the puzzle because a lot of the times people go out in the real world and they expect the dog to learn on site, so Mm -hmm. to speak. Yes. And unfortunately, when the dog is overfaced by distractions right off the bat, that's like trying to learn calculus on a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's not going to happen. The dog needs to be in a calm state of mind. They need to be able to soak in the information and they need to be able to see the value in what you're asking them to Mm -hmm. do, which if they're already seeing the value in trying to chase those leaves down the street, you know, you've already sort of shot yourself in the foot. So, um, Let's talk a little bit about management because I know a lot of people are thinking right now, like how do we bridge that gap? How do we possibly use training to help our dogs understand how they're supposed to act in day-to-day life when they're going to be overfaced by that day-to-day life? So talk about management. What does management mean? Management is looking ahead and preventing things, preventing the dog from forming bad habits. Yeah. Yeah. Is 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 controlling the environment around the dog so nothing bad can happen. Right. So we, we don't want the dog to start to rehearse bad habits. Uh 
you know, and if they start to think, if they start to do something, they're going to think that's right. Yes, absolutely. So we want to manage the environment so they can't make mistakes that we're going to have to fix later. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what makes your life so much easier mm-hmm. if you don't create the mistakes that you have to fix later. So for example, you know, if your dog is a barky dog, you know, there's, there's some breeds you've lived with a Sheltie. Mm-hmm. So you know that the instinct to bark is huge. Right. And e- that's even with knowing that, knowing going into it, mm-hmm. that it's going to be an issue, being ready to deal with it, et cetera. You had mentioned on a previous podcast episode that even with those things, you were still pretty surprised yes. at how barky living with a Sheltie could right. be. Yes. Yes. She, that, you know, she wants to control movement yeah. and her first inclination is, is an emotional bark. That's just, you know, just like when I see a spider, I might go, eek. <laughs> you know, she suddenly sees something quickly move. Yeah. Bark. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So what are some of the things that you did to manage that situation when she was young and you were trying to establish rules with her. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things you did to make sure that she didn't rehearse that barking behavior? Well, I made sure that I controlled the environment so I didn't allow her to sit and look out my front window. Okay. Because if she's looking out my front window, she's seeing things out there that are moving like squirrels or cars or people. And she's going to say, I see them and I bark. And then that neural pathway is going to become even stronger. Yeah, absolutely. And was this a lifelong endeavor? That you never let her sit in front of the window? No, no. Eventually <laughs> she eventually she could sit in front of the window, but only when I was home. Okay. Because I knew that it, it, when I wasn't home, she would sit and bark out the window because my neighbor told me. I thought uh, we were doing well, but uh, one day my neighbor told me that, you, you know, it, when you're not home, Atari's barking at the window. And I had noticed some like dog spit on my window and I wondered <laughs> where that came from. So mystery solved. There so you go. I thought, you know what? I this can't perpetuate. Yeah. So, you know, she can look out the window when I'm home, but when I'm not home, th- they have no access to the window anymore. Yeah. So, I felt bad cuz Honda never barked at the window, but he had to lose access too because I didn't want Atari to rehearse that behavior over and over. Yeah. And you know what? I think that that's a reasonable sacrifice. It's not like you were preventing her from ever being able to look out the window. You were just preventing her from rehearsing the wrong behaviors that come along with that when you could not be there to right. help her understand that it wasn't acceptable. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important. A lot of the times people will give their dogs the freedom before they've done the training. And that really sets you up for such a, a an unfortunate situation and so much more work as time goes on. So think about earning that license. Think about earning that ability to ride the two-seater or two-seater, two-wheel, mm-hmm. two-wheel, right. that's what yep. I wanted to say, to ride the two-wheel bike. This is something that is, it's going to take some time mm-hmm. and that's to be expected. You know, a- anything that is a process is going to take some time. And that means that you're probably going to have to make some sacrifices along the way. Mm-hmm. So, for example, um, we get questions all week long from all sorts of different sources. You know, people will go on our website and send in general contact forms and ask us all sorts of questions. And we're more than happy to to chat and give you some feedback and some advice and, you know, maybe direct you to a program that is going to be helpful for you. And we've had some recent questions about dogs, you know, ignoring recalls, for example. Mm-hmm. So they'll be off playing with another dog and their owner will call them to come. So uh, this is a a fairly infamous thing that happens at leash-free parks as Mm -hmm. well. People get really frustrated because they go to the leash-free park and they let their dogs go and play at the leash-free park and then they can't get them back Mm -hmm. after the play session is over or when they're ready to go home for the day. So this is a a case in point of this dog not being ready for that freedom. So what sort of advice would you give to somebody who was in that scenario where they, they've, they've reached out to us and they've said, you know what, my dog, I let him go and play with these other dogs. And when I call him, he just ignores me. He doesn't respond at all. Well, your dog is finding more value in the other dogs or the other distraction than they find in you. And that's a slippery slope because once they start to find more value in other things, they're going to start ignoring you. Yeah. And it will only get worse. It's not going to get better on its own. So you do need to train that dog. Yeah, So training and also curtailing those activities and behaviors. So if I'm at the dog park and my dog's ignoring me, he loses that privilege. Yes. That, that's what happens. Only, you know, an, an untrained dog 
can't have all these privileges. These are privileges for a trained dog. Absolutely. And and I know that a lot of people really want to enjoy this life where their dogs go and play with other dogs. And there's nothing there's nothing innately wrong with that. Mm-hmm. I, I would say that there should be some structure surrounding the play. We do not advocate for leash free parks simply because of the anonymity factor there. Right. Um, and yes, yes, and just the, the horrible injuries that yeah, can happen in them. Absolutely, and, well, and detrimental to dogs' temperaments. Yeah, absolutely. And we've um, we've put out a podcast episode about dog to dog play. I've got uh, blog posts that I've written about mm-hmm. dog to dog play and the some of the fallouts from too much dog to dog play. Actually, we had um, somebody talking the other day with us about their dog will not eat at all in the presence of another dog and the dog consistently goes to daycare and the daycare workers have to isolate him and put him in another room to get him just to eat his food and right away my brain as a dog trainer goes to that is very overwhelmingly obsessive behavior and we talk a lot about obsessive behavior in certain contexts but we seem to in today's society where it Dogs are constantly sort of forced into Mm -hmm. these play scenarios with each other and with other dogs. It ends up being a huge detriment because they become so obsessive with other dogs that, you know, something fundamental like being able to eat, being able to eat a meal, being able to take food in the presence of another dog. That dog is so stimulated by the opportunity to play with the other dogs or just the appearance of the other dogs that that desire to eat goes out the window. And I would say that is an unhealthy obsession with play with other dogs. It's similar. It's an addiction. The dog is addicted. And, uh, you know, we, you know, we know addiction is an unhealthy thing in people and it's also unhealthy in our dogs too. But yet we often allow our dogs to become addicted because for some reason society is pressuring us to think it's the right thing to do to allow dogs to play like that. Yeah. I think you hit the nail right on the head there. It's a societal pressure and we think that our dogs need to have all these friends and all this, that, and the other. You know, I, I mean... Our own dogs, they spend a lot of time playing with us mm-hmm. and very little time playing with other dogs. Right. And yes. like, um, as an example, have have a look at our YouTube live stream. We just live streamed our, our lesson one of our life skills program. Um, it, by the time this episode releases, it'll be a couple of weeks old at that point. But go and have a look and you will see uh, we have a room full of dogs and we're all working with our dogs. We're playing with our dogs. You know, it's at, at some point, it's it's quite uh, quite the party where everybody is playing with their dog at the same time in in closed mm-hmm. close enough quarters that if these dogs were obsessed with playing with the other dogs, it would be a non-functioning environment. Right. It would be completely non-functioning. But every single dog in those demos that you'll be able to see on that um, the recorded live stream. Every single one of those dogs is into us, right. their handlers. None of them are trying to visit the other dogs because the value is in us. Yes. And that's not to say that they don't ever play with one another. I mean, they do have moments where, where we'll let them have right. a play or we'll walk the property with uh, with another instructor and their dogs and, the, and, and our dogs can play a little bit or go and sniff. Mm. But it's not the first thing they do. So no. it's not the obsessive factor. And it's not the thing they do so often that everything else becomes unimportant. Right. When I walk down the street with my dog, if another dog comes around, they are uninterested in those dogs. Yes. And why do you think that is? Because we've never allowed them to yeah, go and greet all these it. other dogs. You so got it's, it. yeah. 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 I and, am, um, I don't want to say paranoid, but. Uh, it's part of the equation, of course. Mm-hmm. And we get to, we're in a spot where we get to hear a lot of unfortunate stories. So of course that feeds my paranoia. And I just, it's not worth the risk to me right. to let my dog greet a strange dog out there on the street. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually have an article uh, called The Trouble with Dog to Dog Play. You can find that on McCandDogs.com. And it outlines all the rules that I have to have in place in order to allow my dog to play with another dog. That other dog has to be under control. They have to be friendly they have to be healthy these seem like really obvious things as i'm saying them out loud but when i go to a if i were to ever go to a leash free park don't do it i do not go to a leash free park um but if i were to ever actually that's not true i should tell you i used to take walks with my mother at the leash free park when she was in long-term care and we would go for these but with no dog with no dog right exactly my dogs would never be part of the equation but it was nice and stimulating for her and it was close to her residence and it was a place that we could go and she really enjoyed going the nathan cirillo 
Yes. Yes. That's it. That's a beautiful leash free park. Yeah. Not that we, we advocate it, but it, it's, it's well, well set up. I think that one, I think the difference with that park is it's not just a closed in fenced space mm-hmm. where there's nothing for the dogs to do, but play with one another. It's a big, long walking trail mm-hmm. and you can move through the park and you know, if that is something that you're doing and your dog is learning to ignore the other dogs or, you know, uh, even in, in some situations, politely mm-hmm. greet some other dogs, if all is going well, that's a great setup for those sort of scenarios. It's the scenarios where it's this, you know, 12 by 12 space and the dogs all have to contain in that space and play in that space where things can really quickly right. go Right, the canine awry. boxing ring. Yeah, there you go. There you go, exactly. So mm-hmm. um, I, like I said, I... I took my mother to a leash free park so we could enjoy walks <laughs> together, but I would never take my dog there. And um, that article sort of outlines all of the rules that have to be met before my dog can play with another dog. And I want to make sure that if something happens during that play, you know, dogs have spats, they have disagreements, mm-hmm. you know, one dog might bite another one too hard in play right, yeah. when they're wrestling with their mouths mm-hmm. or you know, there might be a moment. I want to make sure that I can use my voice and very quickly call my dog out. Whoever owns the other dog can very quickly call their dog out. Mm-hmm. I also want to make sure that when I'm setting up a play session, it's not just about the play. Right. So I want to make, what are some of the things that you do when you're doing a play session with, uh, with one of your dogs? Well, if I'm doing a play session, I make sure I've given permission to the dog to play. Mm -hmm. So it's a very clear, okay, go play. So let's stop it. Let's stop on that for a second, because I want to deep dive a little bit more into that because it's not just, I'm telling my dog, okay, go play and then letting them go. What other factors are you looking for in that moment? I I want the dog to be focusing on me. Perfect. So I want my dog to be not like leaning into his collar, staring at the other dog and me just giving an okay that falls on deaf ears. Yes, I want the dog to actually truly be hearing it and looking at me and saying like, you control the play. Wow, that's awesome. Thanks for letting me go play. Absolutely. So this is a calm dog. This is a dog who's allowing you to hold their collar without fighting it at Mm -hmm. all. This is a dog that is, you know, uh, looking at you. They're not focused on the other dog. If you could not get that, what would your next step be in that scenario? Obviously, I, you're not going to let the dog no, go. No, I'm not going to let the dog go. I'm going to move away from the other dog. Okay. So I'm going to you know, back away until I am a distance enough away that my dog can give me some full focus. Okay. And then I might do some obedience skills, work Love on a that. few obedience yeah. skills, do a little bit of training, then reassess. Do yeah. I really want, you know, is, is my dog really ready to go and play? Chances are, I would say no at that point. You yeah. know what? he didn't listen. So yeah, I had to work at it. So if I had to work at it, it wasn't easy. I'm not going to allow him to play. He's not ready. Yeah, absolutely. And this is exactly it. If they're not going to be able to listen, they're not ready to be in that freedom scenario where they could potentially decide not to listen. Right. And I love what you just said, that you would take that opportunity to now work some obedience skills. Mm -hmm. And to take that one step further, I would say, hey, you know what? Can we do this again tomorrow? Right. Yes. Can we do this again in a couple of days? Mm -hmm. Like, I really want to keep working through this. And Every single time you set up this scenario and you work on some skills with the dog in the presence of that other dog, it is going to get easier for you. It's going to get easier for your dog to understand, and it's going to build more value for you as well, providing that you're setting up the scenario properly. Yes. I I had a situation actually this weekend. I was traveling up north and I stopped at one of the Ontario en routes. And um, I was waiting for uh, the person I was traveling with to come out of the en route with some food. And Honda and I were sitting in the shade um, on a bench, um, kind of in in the area where people were all milling about. And Honda was just sitting there quietly. And all of a sudden, a lady with a a dog the similar size to Honda, the dog was leaning into its collar and choking and dragging her to Honda. Oh. And she's calling out, oh, can they, can they, can they meet? Can they meet? And I, you know, put my hand out, uh, n- you know, no, I said, my, you know, you know, my dog's elderly, it's hot, like, no. And her dog started barking and carrying on. And it was, I, I would have been definitely embarrassed if yeah. I, if I was her, um, cause there was a lot of people about and, um, yeah, like her dog was dictating what they were going to do. Oh. And, um, 
it was just a bad situation. Yeah, a and bad situation. That's the fallout of the dog pulling to go and see another dog and getting to get there. Right. That's the thing. Dogs will do what's rewarding. So if this dog is used to, oh, I just pull towards the other dog and eventually I get there with, you know, dragging my hundred and whatever pound owner behind right, yes. me. Then they end up in that scenario where mentally all they have to do is keep pulling, pulling, pulling until they get what they right. want. And our, our dogs are smart. So Honda's clever. Mm -hmm. He sees that situation and Honda recognizes that that dog's not under control. I I think it's amazing how our trained dogs seem to know that controlled dogs out of controlled dogs. Yeah. So I could see Honda kind of looking over a little bit alarmed already, like what is coming towards me? Yeah. And, um... You know, so I'm going to advocate for Honda. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah. No, no. Of course, you, your your dog has no control. Yeah. I have a 14-year-old, you know, frail dog. Why would I let your tank of a dog yeah. come over to say hi when you have no control? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's so absolutely important. Something else I think worth mentioning, and uh, this episode wasn't even meant to be about dog-to-dog play. No, but it, it wasn't seems at all. Be, yeah. It seems to be that we're doing a lot of talk about dog-to-dog play, which is okay, because I think these, this is important stuff yes. that we're talking about. Yes, because it is so social. Yeah. yeah. We see it in movies. We see it on TV, and it's always wonderful on TV yeah, and wonderful the in the Disney movies. Model. Yeah, But absolutely. it's not, it's not in the best I, you know, for the relationship of your dog. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's think about two puppies are rambunctious. They love to play with one another. They're very used to playing from litters. And that will oftentimes dictate the first few months of their life. Whenever they see another dog, they want to play, they want to party, etc. So this is a good opportunity for us to say, you know what, you need to have a bit of emotional control here. And If we have taken, so here's the stepping stone for training. If we have some skills that we've established with our young puppies in the white room, now when we get out there into the real world, we can start to try to apply those skills. So if we've gone from the, we've taken the white room, we've added a few distractions, we've added a little bit to it, we've made it a little bit more challenging, and we've taught the dog how to deal with conflict. So that's really what we're doing when we bring distractions into the environment. Now, keep in mind that, Puppies love to play, but that is not necessarily true as they continue to grow. Right. A lot of dogs will become selective about other dogs. A lot of dogs will become very selective about other dogs. And while one one dog might take the path and become really stimulated when they see another dog and don't get to play, another dog might take the path where they see another dog and they're grateful that they don't need to be put in the situation where they're going to play with that dog. And then a lot of the times people will, oh, he's friendly because he's always been friendly or he's always loved to play. So people get a little bit incensed about the idea that their dog doesn't necessarily want to go and play with that other dog. Instead of reading it as the dog growing up and becoming more selective, they read it as, oh, I need to sort of force the dog Mm -hmm. to go and play. And then a lot of the times that creates a defensiveness in the dog. So advocating for Honda in that Mm -hmm. situation is brilliant and exactly what we would recommend for any one of our students or anyone asking us for advice. You know, if your dog says, oh, I just don't want to play with that dog, don't try to push it. Don't don't try to force it. Mm -hmm. Listen to the dog. Listen to what they're asking from you. It's like, you know, if I'm at a a social gathering, there are some people I want to interact with and then there's other people that I don't want (laughs) to interact with. And I wouldn't want my, you know, my partner to be pushing me. Yeah, go talk to that person. Go talk to that oh, person. Absolutely. It's like, no, I'm uncomfortable with that person. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, respect your dog. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh my goodness. So much. So true. Yes. And that's me at the party. I'm in the corner with the dog, petting the dog. Please don't talk to me. People. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not that into No, no. Life. Shannon's <laughs> actually, actually, we have a social function tonight and we I'm do. sure Shannon's going to be the life of the party. I'll be the life of the party. Yeah. Yes. No, we'll we'll yes. see. I'll be in bed by nine. <laughs> As I usually am. (laughs) Alrighty. You know what? I'm going to take a pause at this moment because we had, uh, if you interact with with us on our YouTube channel, you can leave us comments down below. And we have had a request from one of our students. Albert has requested that we do a singing duet because we were singing (laughs) for some reason. We were singing for some reason. And I, for some reason, said we take requests. So now we have to follow through. What? There There was one request for who let the dog dogs out woof 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 is that what they say <laughs> I don't who know, let the I dogs like out better. Ooh, ooh, ooh. 
that we let the dogs out. <laughs> woof, 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 woof. I love that. But yes. Albert actually requested that we sing Time of My Life. Time of Your Life? Now I've had Oh, I don't know if I know that song. Time of My Life. Yes, you do. Okay, you, you just don't want to Okay, let me see. No, I'll sing. I'll sing. I'll sing what I know. I'll sing what I know. And okay. I owe it all to you. Oh, uh, wait. <laughs> I've. <laughs> okay, okay. Stop. Wait, 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 wait. You know wait. what? I think that's good enough. We might have to practice this one because <laughs> I don't really know that song. Now I've had the time of my life. Brilliant. And I owe it all to you. Mm, 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 mm. If I only we could dance with our microphones. I know, yeah, right? yeah. Like, yeah, I, I don't do know enough Patrick words. Patrick Swayze, like, swimming right. and, I, you know. <laughs> Sorry, Albert, I don't really know the words to that song. <laughs> Albert, we tried. Hopefully <laughs> that was good enough. Okay, back to dog training. And I owe it all to you. Parts now, are coming. Now I can't get Swanee back on track. <laughs> I'm obsessed with that song. <laughs> <laughs> it's the new obsession. <laughs> Alrighty. So it, it, it's a misconception to expect our dogs to offer behaviors before we have made it worth their while to offer behaviors and before we have made it possible for them to offer behaviors. So I want to talk a little bit about choice work with dogs because that is a very pow- powerful thing right. to put a dog in a situation and allow them to make a choice that's going to be the right choice for what you want them to do as well. Don't laugh. I can tell you're trying to, you're, you're still trying <laughs> still to stop singing. I'm still thinking about that song. <laughs> I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> Curse you, Albert. <laughs> <laughs> so if we put our dogs in a situation where we ask them to make a choice without necessarily asking them for anything. So say, for example, I'm sitting in a room and I want my dog to look at me. Okay. I might wait. And then if my dog does happen to glance in my direction, Mm -hmm. I'm going to mark that for them. I'm going to say yes. And then I'm going to make that a powerful decision on their part by rewarding it. Right. So that will inevitably create a dog that says, okay, looking at you results in reward. Exactly. Yes. So we do that in our in-person classes. Absolutely. We call it voluntary attention. Right. Yeah. Or even just, uh, you know, you're sitting quietly at your chair. If your dog glances at you. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. If your dog glances at another dog, do nothing. Yeah. That doesn't bring anything. But exactly. looking at me does. And it's funny because my dogs in class usually sit and stare at me the whole yes. time. Well, and the funny thing is, is that students will ask us all the time, how do you get your dog to just stare at you like that? Strictly through capturing, through choice right? work. Yeah. And it, not strictly. I shouldn't say that because we do some luring mm-hmm. for attention as well and whatnot. But my point is that it is a very powerful thing when the dog goes, ooh, I made this decision I got rewarded for it. And therefore, they're, what they're actually doing is mm-hmm. powering their own behavior, yes. which is wonderful. So choice work is great. Mm-hmm. The mistake a lot of people make is they expect the dogs to make a choice in the face of all the conflict we talked about. Right. So if, for example, I go out in the front yard with my puppy and there's three dogs walking past and there's leaves blowing by and there's, you know, cars and traffic and garbage And trucks, jugglers. And jugglers. <laughs> <laughs> and those random jugglers that appear. <laughs> the chances of my dog making the choice to look away from all that action and look to me when there's still a young dog in training are pretty much slim to none. Right. So I'm basically setting myself and my dog up for failure. My dog doesn't know that there's failure there, of course, because they didn't know that there was an expectation to begin with. But basically what's happening is I'm rehe- I'm allowing them to rehearse focusing on all those other distractions and ignoring me. So that will continue to drive their focus on other distractions. It will never end in a situation where my dog goes, oh, maybe if I look at you, things will be better. Mm -hmm. But there is a way to get to that. I would expect Ned at this point, if I went out on my front lawn and I had him sitting at my side, I would expect no problem that he would ignore whatever happens to be going by, you know, even if a a rabbit ran in front of him, Mm -hmm. I would expect him to be able to, okay, glance at the rabbit. And then, you know, he's on leash, he's in a sit, he knows he's under control. I would expect him to eventually forget about that rabbit and look up to me, even without Mm -hmm. giving him any direction. Just the fact that I'm standing there and not doing anything at six years old, 
I would expect him mm. to understand that, but that's because of all the training that has gone right. in yes. in the meantime. Yeah. Like he'll look at you as if he's saying like, what are we doing about this exactly. rabbit? Exactly. Like, what are we doing? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Like, like, did you I, see the yeah, rabbit? Can like, I yeah. Can chase it? Can right? I go? Yeah. And that, that's based on a history of reinforcement. Right. So he has gotten the opportunity to make that choice mm-hmm. in less distracting situations and he's gotten reinforced for it. And then I've gradually increased the distraction. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about voluntary attention as an example and setting that up so that we grow and learn and the dogs are actually successful and get to the point where like Ned, they can, you know, sit and see all this stimulation and then quickly check back in with us. So what am I doing to create that scenario? We start in the white room. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to build value for it in the white room first. And then what? Then um, once the dog is, is responding in the white room, we're going to add some simple distractions into add the that white little room. Bit of color. Yep, add yeah, add a little bit of color. Once they so can do it. So what might a distraction look like? Let's 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 break this right down so that everybody can follow this. They can go home, they can try oh. this drill with their dogs tomorrow and they can get great voluntary attention. So white room first, you've reinforced that. Now right. what what well, kind of distractions well, might you might add? Well, I might start with pre-placing things on the floor. So I'm not going to do it when the dog's there watching. So we're going to put a few things on the floor, maybe a box of Kleenex, maybe a dish rag, maybe... So things that aren't particularly exciting. No, a waste basket. Not a steak right off the bat. No, no. And then I'm going to bring the dog in and the dog's going to notice, oh, the room looks different. Like there's a tissue box on the floor. And they might look at it for a little bit. And then suddenly they're going to check back up to me and say there's a tissue box yeah. and I'm going to say, yes, I like that attention and yeah. I'm going to reward that. So the dog says, Oh, I see something, but I look up to Christine because she's going to reward me and then give me my next direction. Perfect. So if the dog goes to try to investigate the Kleenex box, what are your actions at that point? At that point? Well, it, if I'm working on a sit, I would expect the dog to hold the sit. Right. So I'm going to replace the sit. Okay. Is that what, or? No, that's perfect. Yep. I, I think we're just talking right. training scenarios. So there's and no right or wrong. If, um, if the dog is very distracted by the Kleenex box, then I'm going to move myself away from the Kleenex box perfect. or move the Kleenex box away from ourselves. So yeah. I'm going to minimize the distraction to make it easier. It's like if there's a ginormous spider sitting beside me, and then someone takes away the ginormous spider and puts a tiny one in place, I'm much more relaxed. (laughs) (laughs) You and me both. Um, And and I think that that is a good point to make. You don't always know how your dog is going to react to that Kleenex box. That Kleenex box may be the most benign distraction for dog A, Mm -hmm. and dog B might think that Kleenex box is the best thing in the world. Yes. So if that's the case, if you have dog B, you need to make an adjustment. And that Kleenex box is too big of a distraction for dog B. So maybe you need to just take a piece of small piece of cardboard and put it in place mm-hmm. of that Kleenex box. A matchbox. Box. There you go. Mm-hmm. And But basically the point is that you're trying to temper the distraction so that you get success. Yes. And if you are not getting success, that's an ideal time to change something out, whether it's moving a little bit further away. You know, if my dog is not in that sit position, if my dog is just, you know, out at the end of the leash and they're craning to get to that cardboard, well, I've probably set myself up for Mm -hmm. a little bit of a poor training scenario and I'm going to change something in that moment. So if I am, you know, if I do have the dog loose and they're looking at that cardboard, if I build you know, six or seven feet away from that piece of cardboard, it's going to be a lot easier Mm -hmm. for my dog to go, okay, well, that cardboard is not exciting anymore because I can't get near it and I can't do anything right here or I can't do anything that's getting me value here. So now I'm going to check in and see what in the world is going on behind me. And then when my dog looks at me at that opportunity, I can say yes and I can reinforce. And then what I might do is go from that seven foot distance from that little piece of cardboard into six feet or five feet or four feet. I'm going to make it possible for the dog to, you know, work off of that realization that ignoring that cardboard or ignoring that Kleenex box and looking at me is what gets them the value. They never get the value of that cardboard on the floor or the Kleenex box because it's just not available within their reach. Mm -hmm. And eventually this starts to work in my favor. But if I add the steak to the room, if I add too much to the room, then it does the exact opposite. Right. Okay. So I have sort of the, the, the ultimate one. Great. So I, I had a sight hound, a cowboy and sight hounds are known for, you know, being a little bit, uh, just, I don't know what the word would be. More aloof. Aloof. 
kind of like independent airhead sometimes airheads even. Airheads is a good way. I, w- I was looking yeah. for a nice way to say right, that. Yes. That's a good one. <laughs> so I did a lot with cowboy giving me attention because a dog that's looking at me isn't running away from yes, me. A dog absolutely. that's looking at me is focusing and I have that control. Mm -hmm. So I place tons of value for looking at me while there's distractions, looking at me while there's distractions. And we started off just simply like we're talking about. And one of my ultimate ones I found with Cowboy was she was in a, I might've mentioned this before, a children's production of the opera Aida. Okay. And I was astounded at how well she did on stage with children Aww. and she, they were running and, you know, moving around on stage and costumes and she had to be up there for a long time for about 20 minutes at one point with my son, who was, I think seven at the time holding her and they would have, she would have outweighed him at that point probably. Okay. And, um, she was amongst all that distractions and I was standing off stage and I, once he went onto the stage with her, I came out on the stage to so I could see from the corner what was happening on stage. And she would look at me and look at me and Aww. look at me. And I think she was saying, there's a lot going around, but I know if I look at you, eventually good things are going yeah. to happen. And she, yeah, she she looked at me like she was lock solid on me pretty much that whole time. And I know it's because I created all that value for her to ignore all those distractions around her. Brilliant. And, um, yeah, yeah, I never once, never once in the, during an audition, like during a practice or anything had to go on that stage. She just, yeah, did a great job. And she knew looking at me was a good thing. Yeah, that's wonderful. And this is from that history of reinforcement. It's mm-hmm. from understanding that good things happen when you focus on you. And it's f- that realization has to come from the gradual understanding of that. Yes, and that didn't happen overnight. Exactly. That was that was a lot of work. Like yeah. Cowboy couldn't have gone on that stage at a year old. Yeah. There was no way she'd had enough life experience yet. Gotcha. Yes, but I think she was maybe around six Okay. And she'd had enough like experience at that point that she handled that in stride. Perfect. And it's not a breed that is well known no. for doing things like that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So part of all of this is the management factor and is making sure that your dog's not in over their head. And when, especially when you're looking for them to make a choice, we want to make sure that they're capable of making that choice. Right. So we need to present it in a way that allows them to make the right choice and then get the value out of it. Because if they're making the wrong choice and getting the value out of the wrong thing, then unfortunately it's actually working against us. Right. So the management piece of the equation is huge and making sure you're not putting them in over your head, over their right. head. Yes. And that's one thing using house lines and long lines too. If I, uh, if my neighbor has a barky dog and I take my dog outside and my dog can run away from me and run up and down the fence, barking madly and having a great old time. And I have to tackle my dog to get them to stop. I've been a poor manager at that point. Yes. So absolutely. Well, and, and let's touch on that because that is the person expecting and, and the person who's getting angry at the dog for barking along the fence because they're expecting the dog to self govern and make a good choice in that situation when they're not ready to make that choice. So the management part is just a piece of the equation. Now that we have some skills, we've built some skills in the white room, we've added some color to the room, maybe we've gone out on the front lawn, maybe we've gone out on the back lawn, you know, we've we've spent some time helping our dogs understand what these skills are, whatever Mm -hmm. the skill may be. So, you know, say we're still talking about voluntary attention Uh and wanting our dogs to choose us and then get reinforcement for that. So now what I'm going to do, if I want to use that in real world life, I'm going to do so with a little bit of understanding that the environment has to be tolerable for the dog. So I'm not going to go to the soccer game and expect voluntary attention. I might go to the soccer game and work across the street. Mm -hmm. I might go to the soccer game and work on the other field where there's a chance that my dog is going to make that right choice. Yes, And you're going to look for short flickers too. You're not going to say, okay, I expect 20 seconds of attention. Oh yeah, You're going to say, all you want is that flicker and you can quickly yes that flicker and the flicker will grow. Yes, absolutely. Fan the flames. Fan the flames. Fan those flames. Yes. So when it comes to anything else, else when we're not looking for our dog to actually make that choice on their own when we're going out into an environment and we're expecting to get 
an obedient result. Before we can expect the dog to self-govern, we need to spend time guiding them. And a lot of the times what people will, will do is they'll compartmentalize training here and then real life over here. Mm -hmm. So the training, because it's still in process over here, never sort of meets real life. And then the dog ends up rehearsing the wrong things in real life. So what I want to impress upon people today is to combine those worlds. So take your training. And now when you're in real life scenarios, simplify it. Right. But have the direction given to the dog. Make sure that you're guiding them. You're not just, you know okay, we're not in training mode right now, so I'm just going to let them pull me down the street because I need to get to the place where they're going to need to pee. No, your dog is going to make that choice if that's the choice, the option right, that's yes. given your, to them. Your dog is always learning, Yes, even if you don't think they are. Absolutely. They're learning. Everything they do is a learning yeah, moment. Yeah, that is exactly right. So instead of that pulling at the end of the leash, I'm going to be guiding my dog. Mm-hmm. I don't expect him to know what to do in this scenario yet. He hasn't had enough training. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to let him flounder and I'm not going to let him make the wrong choices. I am going to use my voice. I'm going to use some food. I'm going to use my my leash. I'm going to use all the tools that I have to try to bring some of the skills from this training scenario over here into real world. So it might be as simple as placing my dog in a sit. It might be as simple as using food right on their nose and Mm -hmm. luring them in that scenario. I'm definitely not ever going to let them just crane at the end of the leash and think that that is an acceptable thing to do. So, And that's why early training is so important too, because we can start to get skills when they're young. And they're cooperative. And they're cooperative, yes. Moldable. Yes. (laughs) And they, and they, and they learn to listen to our voice as a puppy. Yeah, absolutely. I, also, too, people, we we need to teach our dogs to behave in the house. Yes. It just doesn't happen. It just doesn't go from training school to suddenly behaving in the yeah. house. We have to spend time sitting on our couch, allowing the dog to investigate so that we can show them what's right and wrong in the house. Yes. So every, everything needs to be taught. Yeah. So... Uh, um, outline this scenario f- where you're sitting on your couch and you're you're helping to guide your dog. Tell me what that looks like in a practical situation. So I'm going to simulate a, a real life situation. So I'm going to turn on my TV so the dog hears the noise of the TV and I'm going to have a long line on my dog and I'm going to be listening to TV and watching my dog. So the dog goes, oh, you know, this is a normal situation. And is your house wide open for the dog to go anywhere and everywhere they want to at No, this point? I'm, I'm going to try to... Uh, c- you know, close areas off. Okay. Now, if I live in a house that can't be cordoned off, then I'm going to be prepared to get up off my couch and and follow the dog to help them, or I'm going to be prepared to, you know, have the long line maybe under my foot. So the dog maybe has a ten foot long line span. They can okay. they can radiate around, and I'm going to watch them very closely. And I'm going to praise good behavior, like mm-hmm. oh wow, like you looked at my table leg, but you didn't chew it. What a good boy! You look yeah. back at me, you get a treat. Yeah. Um. Uh oh, he's heading over to the uh, you know my son's book on the floor. Going to watch closely. He's just sniffing it. What a good dog. You just sniffed the book. That was really good. Good choice. However, if suddenly I see his little mouth opening up to lick and start to, you know, I'm going to interrupt. Hey, 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 leave that. You know, that's not for you. Then I'm going to give him something he can chew on. So I'm going to guide him as to what he can touch and what he can touch. Perfect. Perfect. And this is so important because if they're left to their own devices, they're not going to just automatically fall back on the training from over here. The training scenario that you've set up over here and the real life scenario that you've set up over here, those two aren't going to meet on their own. It's our job to somehow mesh those two worlds and apply what we're learning in training and what our dogs are learning in training to this real life scenario. And the management in the meantime, you know, having a baby gate or having X pens set up or something, you can actually get X pens that are open X pens now that you can use. It's, It's sort of like a portable fencing system Mm -hmm. so if you have an open concept house that's a really good option Mm -hmm. for those open concept houses because you can sort of put it across the entire room and then you can have it have it sectioned off so that you and your puppy are in this one section Mm -hmm. the choices are limited that's what is beneficial about this if your puppy has the entire house to run around and investigate and get into mischief about it's not a very good training scenario if you're sitting on the couch in the living room and trying to figure out what he's where he went yes yeah you have to get up and follow them yes yes absolutely and I spend I I, just as much time as I spend training actual skills 
I spend on teaching my dog just to be in the house. Oh, let's talk about that for a bit because that is so important, especially the the breeds that um, are really popular right now tend to be very bouncy, happy breeds. There's a lot of doodles that are coming our way. Mm-hmm. There's a, a lot of um, Aussies right yes. now are incredibly popular, which I understand they're beautiful dogs, mm-hmm. but they're working dogs right. and they're busy dogs and they need a job and they need direction. They can't be left to their own devices because they'll be up and moving and investigating and tearing apart and doing mm-hmm. all sorts of things that they really shouldn't be doing if you're not doing a good job of supervising and managing and training etc so some of these dogs they need to be taught an off switch right so what are some of the things that you do to make you make sure that your dogs are learn to be calm in the house well i i reward calmness Perfect. so being calm brings big rewards so calm dogs get delicious chewies calm dogs get uh, you know good food treats uh, they get lots of, you know, praise and, and um, yeah. just calmness. So, yeah, when my dog's being good, are I there, take notice. And are there specific skills that you teach that you rely on to help impart that calm? Well, I do teach, um, like, mat work, so a bed okay. stay. So teaching my dog to go and lie down on a mat and to, to value lying on that mat. Perfect. Um, I discourage my dogs from being crazy in the house. So um, that's my long line. I use that. Yeah. Um, I, I want, I like calmness. Yeah. I'm, I'm peaceful and I like, I like to be the opposite. I like my dogs to have an off switch. No, to always be off and to have an on switch. Oh, and when I, I turn, that. I turn them on. Yeah. Whereas, yes. Yeah. I don't, it's easier to turn on a dog than to turn off a dog. It's that's true. That's how I think. So yeah. that's kind of my training thing is I, I promote calmness. Yeah. This is the evolution of your dog training career because you started with Malinois who are anything but calm. Right. Yes. So it must have been a necessity and then like just followed you through as right. you continue yes. to get dogs. Yes. So yeah, to have, teach a dog to have a, an off switch, I'm going to do a lot of housework. So yeah. like a lot of management in the house and, uh, you know, if you can't be calm and listen in the house, then how can you be calm and listen at the park? Yeah. So it's... Yeah. And there's there's time for hyper. There's time for fun and boisterous. Right. And, you know, even I'm sure in having having a desire to have a peaceful life, mm-hmm. I'm sure there are times where you want to tug and play. And, oh, right. You know, yes. And, and let your hair down and let your dogs let yep. their hair down. And so. they do. They yeah. do. They, you know what? As soon as I'm like, woohoo, we get out the tug toy and they're like, hooray. There's and, the on switch. Right. Yeah. 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 And they, and, you know, they, they play quietly in the house. They, but you know, they look to me for play and I, they're being, you know what? You guys are being really good and calm. Let's throw your ball down the hall a few times. So I'm going to reward that yeah. calmness. I'm not going to have them suddenly thrust a ball in my lap and say, Christine, it's time to play with us. It's like, no, it doesn't work like that. I will decide when you're being good, it's time to play. Perfect. Perfect. And and trying to ensure that your dogs have an understanding of rules in day-to-day life is just as important as training individual skills mm-hmm. because you have to live with them in day-to-day life. You right. know, it's lovely when they're in training mode, but training mode happens all the time because right. our dogs yes. are learning all the time. So keep that in mind. And I look for, I look for opportunities all of the time to reward my dogs for things that I like them doing. Mm -hmm. You know, that choice work that we were talking about, having them make good choices on their own is a very, very powerful thing. So for example, if I walk into the kitchen and I'm getting their food ready and they sit politely beside me instead of trying to jump on the counter and investigate what I'm doing, I take that opportunity to say, oh, you're such a smart little puppy. Yes. And I'll reward Oops, not what? the mic. And I'll reward them for right. that. Yes. So then that becomes the default behavior. And I've never had a counter surfing problem in my house mm-hmm. because whenever my dogs are in the kitchen with me when they're young dogs, I look for those opportunities. So they don't ever figure out that there's value for jumping up on the counter and trying to scavenge things up there. Actually, I shouldn't say I've never had a counter surfing issue because my Rottweiler Quincy is the reason that I made sure that I was very aware of right, rewarding yep. good opportunities in the kitchen because she did counter surf. Mm-hmm. And we always made sure that there was nothing on the counter for her to get reinforced by. But um, she was my first dog and I was just learning. And it was it was a bit of a, yes. a problem to work uh-huh. through as she grew and as she got accustomed. I didn't really understand rehearsal at that point. Mm-hmm. So 
She got used to the idea of jumping on the counter and investigating things. And even though she never got anything, this was the part that I remember my, my knowledge gap being so confusing here because everybody would say, you know, if it's, if there's something rewarding Mm -hmm. up there, then of course she's going to continue to do it. And I kept thinking, but she's never gotten anything like our house was not, Mm -hmm. there was not the opportunity for her to steal a turkey or steal a loaf of bread or, you know, take anything off the counter. There was never that situation where she got reinforced before it. But here's what I was missing. The instinct of the dog as an opportunistic scavenger, there is reward in the investigation. Yes. So it's not just about them Mm -hmm. getting an actual edible reward off the counter it's also about that opportunity and right. enjoying investigating well, like what's on the counter people who go in antiquing oh they love to go antiquing every morning not every morning every weekend <laughs> and it's not that they find an antique every week to buy uh, it's the yeah. it's the love of yeah. going antiquing the love of the, the thrill of the hunt the Isn't thrill of the, the hunt that's a good marketing campaign yeah. then i yeah. fully understand it now right ah you know what? Very interesting because yes. you're absolutely right. And it's the same thing. Like right. if we're anticipating going to a show on the weekend because we love to go to shows, whatever show that might be, mm-hmm. then that's rewarding for us as well right. because we have that thing to look forward to. There's all these instincts that we have to think about. Right. And I love that. That's yes. a great analogy, yes. the antiquing one. One thing I like to do with my dogs when I am feeding them, so uh, so I'm getting out their food bowls and they're excited. Yay! eating time and I'll take a few kibbles and we'll play kibble chase. So while I'm getting their food ready, it's like, oh, here comes one, get it. And I roll it across the floor and off they run and then get it and throw another one the other way. So my dogs now often, when I'm getting ready their food, they're staring at the floor. Uh Is she going to toss one for us? Is she going to toss one? It gives them a whole other focus. So instead of jumping on me and being goofy and silly, it's like, who's going to get the kibble? Is it going to be me? Or Atari who runs there first. Of course, I make sure they they would all get them. Yes. But uh, yeah, so chase the kibble while I'm getting their food ready. And they think it's the most awesome game. (laughs) And they love getting their food because they might have the opportunity to chase and hunt a kibble. Oh, that's fun. Mm -hmm. That's very fun. And dual purpose. Yeah. It helps to take that focus off the counters. It helps to establish what they should be doing in the kitchen and what they shouldn't be doing. Right. In the kitchen. Yes. That's great. That, that's one of our living room games too, is uh, chase the kibble or chase the Cheerio. Oh yes. Oh. Cause my dogs love Cheerios. So sometimes while I'm watching TV, I will bring the Cheerio box in and, um, <laughs> It's kind of funny, but, you know, I just start tossing Cheerios around the living room <laughs> and the dogs, oh, they love it. And, you I know, some, some go under things and, yeah. and it's funny now because Honda's lost his sight and, um, you know, there'll be a Cheerio right in front of him and he's like, oh, where's the Cheerios? <laughs> and then he has to use his nose to find them. Oh but it's goodness. like, it's a special fun game absolutely. Yeah, where they get to hunt Cheerios. Oh, absolutely. They're and mighty hunters. Like mighty yes. hunters. The mighty modern hunter. Shannon, would you like to come to my house one day and play Cheerio? I want to hunt Cheerios at your house. Yes, please. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. I'll tell Wait, Honda please. he's got a guest. I prefer <laughs> Honey Nut. Honey Nut? Honey Nut Cheerios. Yes, I, thank you. I've only ever tried the plain or the multigrain. Oh, I'm not coming then. Definitely not for multigrain. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe well, if you smear some frosting on it. Frosting. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Kidding. yeah, but it's funny. No, though I've created little monsters now. If someone has Cheerios at the house as a breakfast cereal, the dogs just assume like oh, those are mine, right? Yeah, because <laughs> I buy Cheerios as dog treats, not oh as breakfast God. cereal. <laughs> oh, that's adorable! Very adorable. All right, so back to um, back to the idea of choice work. I I want to. My goal is to make it very clear that dogs are not going to be ready to self govern until you have taken the time to teach and train and clarify what their jobs are supposed to be and built value for those things. You want to get to a point where you're on a random reinforcement schedule before you expect them to self-govern and make the right choices out there in the real world. And once you get to that point, it's going to be, it's going to move along swimmingly and you're going to have these wonderful skills to rely on for life. And you can start to, you can do things like tell them, okay, go play and then be able to call them out of that play with other dogs. You can do things like expect them to listen in busy environments and expect them to follow direction in busy environments, but you can't put the cart before the horse with that and allow them to do all the ignoring first 
in hopes that they're going to make a good choice. You know, it, it, they're, they're going to make dog choices, right? That's, that's yes. the thing. They're dogs. They're going to make choices that make sense for their instinct. They don't know they're supposed to be doing anything different. They don't know they're supposed to be learning how to live and coexist in a human world. Mm-hmm. So take the time it takes to teach them. Make sure that you are guiding them when you get out there and you start to build their skills in real world and remember to apply the skills. When you know that they are capable of listening to those skills, make sure that you use those skills in day-to-day life. It's not just training over here and then real life happens over here and somehow those two shall meet. You need to make a conscious effort to apply the training skills in real life, make it valuable for your dog, And then from there, you can move on. And on that note, I'm Instructor Shannon. I'm Instructor Swanee. Happy training. Happy training. The McCann Dogs Podcast is brought to you by McCann Professional Dog Trainers. We help dog owners to have a well-behaved, four-legged family member. Please give us a call at 905-659-1888 or visit us at mccanndogs.com. Happy training.